Galloway. Got it, Skipper. Yeah, I'll bring him. He's my partner, after all. What have we got? New case. White female dumped in plain sight in the grass at the end of Hill Street. Hacks are all over it. Captain's trying to fend him off. That sounds awfully similar. The first rule of police work is make no assumptions until you've seen the evidence. Skipper wants you to have your newspaper face on, college boy. I think I know the place where they found the lady. It overlooks Sunset Boulevard. Let's go. Another day, another murder. It's only Cole's second kiss on the homicide desk, and despite his success with the red lipstick murder, his partner, Rusty Galloway, still seems less than enthused to be working with him. Heading outside, we can take Rusty's car to the scene of the crime. You did a decent job on the Henry case, Phelps. Not bad for your first time at bat. Thanks, Rusty. But don't go getting ahead of yourself. That's one clearance under your belt. Now it's a new day with a new dead lady that needs our attention. And no assumptions until we see the evidence, right? Right. See, I knew you were a fast learner, Phelps. You might get along after all. We arrive at the crime scene at 10.48 a.m., and the media hacks like vultures are already circling the corpse. Now, boys, boys, you know as much as I do. I'll be holding a press conference once the autopsy is being completed. I have two of my finest investigators on the case, fresh from bringing down the sword of justice on the crazed sex... Captain, aren't Windows. there similarities between this murder and the murder of Celine Henry? And of Elizabeth Short, for that matter. So you don't matter. believe there's a crazed sex killer at large boys, preying on women? Boys, be sensible. We have the greatest police force in all the world with the greatest scientific investigators at our disposal. How can any killer continue to beat that? Be advised. We keep the gas chamber at San Quentin primed for the sons of Cain who continue to believe they can take a life in the City of Angels. Yeah, right. Any new leads in the Dahlia case? Run along, boys, and let these officers get to work. We have God's work to do here, and it can't be delayed. What do we have, Captain? Another woman sacrificed. Speak to Carruthers. I want daily reports, gentlemen. But the journalists raise a good point. This murder bears striking resemblance to both the Red Lipstick murder and the Black Dahlia case. But we caught the culprit in our last video, so is this just a copycat case? Or did we get the wrong guy last time? Detective, I was first on scene. You find her, Gonzalez? Not me. A family out for a stroll. I was first reported. Can you show me the body? It's under the pepper tree, this way. Despite how confident he was we got the right guy, Captain James Donnelly is clearly perturbed by the similarities between the two cases. Heading up the hill, we pass by Ray Pinker. Can't be much help to you, Phelps. And arrive at the crime scene to see Carruthers already here. Similar MO. To what? The Dahlia? I don't think so. Celine Henry. That's a closed case. This is probably another sad sack who lost his temper with a broad who wouldn't put out. Are you a suspect, Rusty? Watch your mouth, Phelps. All I'm saying is we got enough to do without reopening closed cases. Talk me through it, Mal. Severely battered, on display. Footprints would indicate that she has been stomped. Size of the footprints would seem to indicate a smallish men's shoe. What size shoe did Mendez wear? You finished? No, I'm not. At a glance, I would say strangulation was the cause of death. I need to do further tests for semen. Angry boyfriend. If they were married, they'd be at home. Not humping out here in Lover's Lane. You mind if I examine the body? Be my guest. Goodness, Rusty really doesn't want us to reopen the last case. What was it he said a moment ago about no assumptions before we see the evidence? Look at your mark. It's very distinctive. I'll do some comparisons back at the lab and get back to you. Carruthers here raised an excellent point. We arrested and charged Alonzo Mendez for the red lipstick murder. And during that investigation, we discovered that he also had a shoe size of eight. But he certainly couldn't have been out here stomping around. Moving to the right hand. Looks like she was tied up. It does at first, but that would leave a mark on her other wrist, too. I think her watch might have been torn off. Moving to her left hand. What's this mark? Cut on a finger. Fourth finger, left hand. A wedding or engagement ring. Violently removed. And then examining her chest. The stomping angle in the Henry case. Was it reported in the press? Sure was. 
Every detail a copycat would want was there in the story. The exact same stomp mark at the exact same angle, made from the exact same size of shoe. It could be a copycat, but if so, it's a very well done copycat. Moving to evidence marker B, we see the same size 8 footprints leading from where the car must have parked to where the killer ultimately dumped her corpse. Moving to evidence marker C, we find the victim's purse. Well, we have a name. Can you run Deirdre Muller by R&I? Back in a second. And she worked for some sort of parent-teacher association. Oh, that means that she's a mother. Next to this, we find a wad of bills. If the motive was robbery, why not take the money? The money is still here. Her name tag is still here, but her watch and ring are missing. The killer wasn't careless enough to overlook this handbag. After all, he murdered the woman, stripped her naked, and dumped her body here. Detectives, R&I says a Deidre Mahler of 130 North Bonnie Bray was reported missing this morning by her husband, Hugo Mahler. What'd I tell you? Just grab the husband, take him downtown, and work him over. We could have this wrapped up by lunchtime. What about not making assumptions and going on the evidence? No, he planted this handbag here. He wanted us to find it, which means he wanted us to know her name. Why? Sure, her husband could have reported her missing in an attempt to not look guilty, or he could have reported her missing because he really wasn't guilty, and he really didn't know where she was. Rusty appears to be more concerned by his lunch than apprehending the right man. Either way, the husband is the only lead we have at the moment, so heading back to the car, we can make our way to the residence of Deirdre Muller. There still might be some play in the boyfriend angle. I thought we were on our way to lock up the husband. If it doesn't work out, that is. Deirdre Muller has suffered enough. More than enough. You shouldn't make disparaging comments about her without even the slightest inkling of what she was like. She was a woman, wasn't she? Well, around about my third divorce, I realized women might not be the pure angels we imagined. You're married, ain't you, Phelps? Don't make any insinuations about my wife. Hey, she's a woman. She's the mother of my children. <laughs> you're a father, Cole? But don't tell me your eye don't bend. This conversation is over. Cole and Galloway arrive at the Muller residence at 11.04 a.m. But despite there not being a car in the driveway, there is a light on inside. Phelps and Galloway, LAPD. Is your father home? He'll be home soon. He's been out looking for mommy. What's your name, miss? Michelle Eloise Muller. Can we come in? I suppose so. Thank you. Could you have a seat for me, Michelle? We're going to have a look around. <sighs> How do you tell a daughter that her mother was murdered in such a horrifying way? Well, before Deirdre's husband and Michelle's father comes home, we can take a look around. Heading into the hallway, the first room on the left appears to be the kids' room. So stepping out and turning into the next room, we see that this must be the parents' bedroom. And the first thing we see is a pair of boots by the window. Work boots. Size 8. Size 8. And caked with mud. Nearby, we see Deirdre's vanity, and on it we find two boxes. The first is a rectangular red one. Elgin wristwatch. Probably the same one snatched from her body. But why would the killer take an expensive watch and leave all that money in the purse? Setting this down, we can examine a square blue box next to it. No sign of a wedding ring. A ring box, possibly for her wedding ring. But again, why take the jewelry but leave the money? Unless the value of these items wasn't the motive. Perhaps the killer took them for sentimental reasons. And if that's so, then the murderer must be close to home. Those are all the clues we find in the house. So heading to the living room, we can have a very hard conversation with young Michelle. Is this about mommy? Daddy is trying to find her. 
Please tell me she's okay. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Michelle, but your mother is dead. <laughs> Do you think you could answer a few questions for us? I could try. We'll start by asking her about the missing watch and rings. Some of your mother's jewelry was missing. Can you describe her things? Ring, a watch. I never paid much attention to that stuff. Maybe not, but young girls like this often try to emulate their mothers, putting on their mother's makeup, playing with their mother's clothing. It therefore would be surprising that Michelle wouldn't know anything about her mother's jewelry. However, she doesn't look like she's trying to conceal something. If anything, she looks heartbroken. And at the moment, she's just trying to deal with her loss. Maybe she was dismissive about the jewelry because she didn't think it was important. In which case, playing the good cop might just coax her into telling us what she knows about the jewelry. I know it's painful, Michelle, but this may be important. She wore a wedding ring? Mommy chose it herself. A rose gold wedding band and a matching diamond and ruby engagement ring. She wore a watch? Yes, a yellow gold Elgin watch. Daddy bought it for her birthday. We had a fight. It was kind of a makeup present. There we go. She knew more than she let on. And now we have a description of both pieces of missing jewelry. When did you last see your mother? Yesterday afternoon. I went to a dance at Belmont High. Mommy was supposed to pick me up, but she didn't show. So what did you do then? I was upset. Daddy came instead. Whoa. She seemed really defensive there. Cole didn't ask her how she felt. He asked her what she did to get home. She almost sounded like she was trying to defend herself, or someone and her demeanor has changed as well she no longer appears to be preoccupied by the death of her mother now she seems to be preoccupied by something else something that troubles her a little bit something that confuses her a little bit something that's making this conversation with cole phelps a little awkward she meets eye contact but regularly averts her gaze she said that her dad came to pick her up instead which is likely true she is after all here at home but there's more to the story that she's not telling us. Since she appears to be purposefully hiding it, we'll use a bit of bad cop to see if she'll share the truth. So you were hanging around the school for quite a while. What happened with your father? I don't know. I called and called and finally he answered. He came straight away then. So mom was supposed to pick her up, but she never showed. She calls dad. And Dad doesn't pick up the phone. Why, was he at work? Was he sleeping? Or was he somewhere else? If he was somehow involved in his wife's death, we need a motive. And now's a good opportunity to ask their daughter about the state of their marriage. Your mom and dad are uh, happily married? What are you saying? Of course they are. And again, pretty defensive almost as if it's a touchy subject, and her demeanor has shifted again. She now looks angry, almost bitter, as if she resents being put in this position. I can hear her inner monologue. If only Mommy and Daddy were happily married, I wouldn't have to be lying to this police officer. How could they do this to me? Why can't they just love each other? I love them both, isn't that enough? Based on her behavior here, we can doubt that she's telling us the truth about the state of her parents' marriage. They weren't happy, were they, Michelle? Did your father ever hit your mother? Just the once. She said she would leave him if he ever did it again. He bought her a brooch pin to make up for it. And he always wore her golden butterfly. Thanks, Miss Muller. You've been very brave. Hey! What gives? Daddy, the police are here. Go to your room, here. please, Michelle. I'll talk to the police. Daddy, mommy is gone. Go to your room, young lady. She's not even out of school. You can't come in here interrogating her like she's your some kind of... Your wife was found murdered this morning. Found? What the... But, but she only... We have some questions that we would like to ask you. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I'll do my best. 
What do we think about that response? His daughter tells us that he's been away from the house searching for his wife. Presumably when he comes home, he doesn't know that his wife has been killed and is shocked when he sees the police here. His first instinct was not to inquire about the state of his wife, but instead to send his daughter out of the room. He didn't want her to see what was about to happen. And when we dropped the bombshell that his wife was dead, was that reaction normal? I don't know, it's hard to tell. People respond to grief in a variety of ways. And even if he wasn't sad that she's dead, that's not proof that he killed her. We need to ask him some questions. So we'll start by talking about the footprints we found at the crime scene. What size shoe do you wear, Mr. Muller? Why do you ask? It's routine, sir. Simple process of elimination. Nines, I think. He had to think about that for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and he's sitting here with shifty eyes. All about the size of his shoes? Seems like an odd thing to be nervous about, which he clearly is, unless his shoe size can reveal a darker secret. And we know that he's lying. Why are you lying to me, Mr. Muller? Why would I lie to you at a time like this? Great question, Hugo. Why would you lie at a time like this? Unless you were involved with your wife's death. We know that the footprints at the crime scene came from a smaller sized shoe, but that's not the evidence we need to prove that he's lying. To prove that he's lying, we can point to the size 8 work boots we found in his bedroom. That's funny. The work boots we found here are size 8s. Why lie about it if you've got nothing to hide? Because I always get teased about the size of my feet. <laughs> you know, small feet, small... Always been true in my experience. <laughs> exactly how much experience do you have, Rusty? One data point does not a sample make. But really? Hugo would lie to the police about his shoe size because of... that? Uh, maybe if he was incredibly immature. But this is supposed to be a 46-year-old man. I'm having a hard time believing that he would lie for such a silly reason. You phoned in a missing persons report this morning? Yeah, that's right. Uh, my wife didn't come home last night. She left around... She left around 9.30. Uh, Michelle was out at dance. She called me to let me know that Deidre didn't turn up. What is with the performance this guy is putting on? Either he's the world's worst liar, or he's trying to put on some sort of show. He sure had to think a while to remember the time his wife left last night. It also sounded like he was about to say one time, but then he stopped himself, glanced up at Cole, remembered who he was talking to, and then he came up with his 9.30 time. And he sits here acting more nervous than anyone we've interviewed to date. He gulps, makes eye contact briefly, as if trying for a moment to build up some confidence. Then he twists his head to the side, gulps again, closes his eyes and sighs, as if he's frustrated by this conversation, as if it's a nuisance. We don't have evidence that his wife left at 9.30, but we have every reason to doubt his story. Did your wife ever go out by herself? To bars? Nightclubs? No. What are you, what are you suggesting? You suggesting my wife's loose? <laughs> now is not the time for you to be pushing me, mister. Your daughter said you were having an argument. We argued about who would pick up Michelle. I worked a full day. I wanted to come home, put my feet up. Reasonable and possible. But even though he didn't give us any proof that he is lying, he also didn't give us any proof that his wife left at 9.30. We just have to take his word for it. But now we need to know exactly where Hugo was while his wife was supposed to be picking up their daughter. So you were here all night. You stayed in while your wife went out to pick up your daughter? Yes, that's correct. And suspicion just drips from this guy. Seems like no matter what body posture he adopts, he always looks uncomfortable in his own skin. He is sitting back with his hands in his lap, shrinking into his chair, almost as if he's trying to retreat into the shadows so as not to be seen. He just wants Cole to look the other way, but his facial expressions give him away. He sits here bobbing his head, looking up, looking down, looking left, looking right. Perhaps it's shock, after all he just learned his wife was killed. But then, we know he's lying here. You should come clean if you're having an affair, or if there's something going on. 
I told you I was here. Were you saying I wasn't? We don't know where he was, but if he was here, why did he let the phone ring and ring and ring and ring when his daughter called him to come pick her up? So why did you take so long to answer the phone when your daughter called? Okay, I went out for a while. I was I was driving around. It's my way of relaxing. Things are not looking good for Hugo Muller. We can paint a pretty dark picture about this man. And the fact that his daughter told us that Hugo hit his wife doesn't really help. Your wife was beaten and then strangled. In your case, you have no alibi and a history of violence towards your wife. That's not, that's not true, goddammit. And again, he looks nervous. And again, we can prove he's lying. It is true, Hugo. You're a violent man. You try to keep a lid on it at home, but sometimes you lost control. Your daughter and your wife were scared of you. You don't know anything about me. Maybe not. We have only been here for a few minutes. But in that time, we learned that he bought his wife a butterfly brooch as a way of saying sorry for hitting her. I know about the golden butterfly, Hugo, and how you bought your wife off the last time you heard her. She liked to spend money, all right? Dresses, uh, jewelry, her hair. It drove me goddamn crazy. Do I look like a Rockefeller? Nobody likes a cheapskate, Hugo. Getting hostile with us is a very bad idea, Hugo. I'm no murderer. Make some arrangements for your daughter and then present yourself to Central Station for questioning. You gotta be kidding me, Phelps. Put the cuffs on him. This is an outrage. I didn't kill my wife. Your daughter is in the next room, Muller, so I'm giving you a break. Don't make me change my mind, and don't make me come looking for you. We should go back in there and bust his ass. One, we need to break his alibi, check phone records, canvas the neighbors. Two, we have motive of domestic violence, which probably goes for half the men in L.A. Three, we have no evidence tying him to the crime scene. Hello, detective. A neighbor across the street goes out of her way to wave us down. Yes, ma'am. I heard the terrible news over the radio. And you can help us with our inquiries? Yes, sir. They had a row last night. I heard Mrs. Muller screaming. Did you see Mrs. Muller come home late last night at all? No, not at all. I did see Mr. Muller put something in the incinerator earlier this morning, though. I told you he was our guy. Now let's get this bum downtown and into a cell. Look, there he is now. We see Hugo Muller burning something in a barrel, racing across the street as we get close. Step away from the incinerator. Don't let him get away. Okay, but no shooting. We need this guy to make the case. He books it. Leaving his daughter alone in their house, he races down an alley. What a moron, this guy. Where does he think he's going? Even if he does outrun us, what, is he just going to abandon his daughter? Thankfully, he's not that fast, and Cole Phelps catches up quickly. Hugo Muller stands with his hands up, and we can inspect the incinerator to see exactly what he was burning. This doesn't look good, Hugo. I, c- I can explain the blood. Ooh, size eights. And this pair is covered in blood. These shoes are damning evidence. Get him booked in at Central, officer. Then put him in an interview room. We'll be speaking with him later. And inform the cat. Yes, sir, detective. Is there someone you can call, miss? I don't know it's home and... You need somewhere to stay, Michelle. You have other family? Grandparents? Aunts or uncles? Call Aunt Helen, but she lives in Bakersfield and... Call her. We're going to get someone down here from Juvenile Hall to talk to you in the meantime. We ought to get some uniforms down here, clean up, take care of the kid. Galloway, Homicide Division, badge number 564. Go ahead, Detective Unit. Can we get Ray Pinker and a technical services team to a house at 130 North Bonnie Bray Street? Send someone down from Juvenile Hall to look after a young lady. Roger, 11K. Inform Detective Phelps that the coroner has a report waiting. The police morgue downtown when he's available. Got it, KGPL. So Carruthers has a report for us. We'll start by heading to the central morgue. I'm surprised, you know. 
I didn't make the husband for it. Always make the husband, Phelps. Nine times out of ten, it's the closest person to the Vic who does the deed. God knows I wanted to kill some wives in my day. Lex Parsimonii. What? The law of parsimony. Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is most likely the correct one. You know, you could have said that without getting all liturgical on me. I'll try to dumb things down from now on. Appreciate it. And try this one on for size. Rusty's razor. How's that go? You blame the guy that's banging her. Ah, uh, of course. The famous Lex Ignoramus. Closes cases, Cole. Puts a lot of people away, that one. We arrive at the Central Morgue at 3.37 p.m. Heading through, we see Carruthers waiting for us in the morgue. Phelps, Rusty, thanks for coming. Can you blood type the shoes that we bagged and see if they're a match? Sure. It'll all be in the report, but I'm assuming you want the details now? Please. Cause of death is strangulation? Correct. Take a look at the samples on the bench. Taking a look at the bench, we see casts from the shoes. The shoe prints? Size eights. Very similar to the impressions from the Henry case. Now, who do we remember got caught in bloody size eights? I think we have our bird. Next to the shoe prints, we see three strands of rope and a photograph of our strangled victim. The first one is a thick manila strand of rope, but it doesn't really match the ligature marks. Next is a thinner white nylon rope, but no, that doesn't match the markings either. The final one is a triple braided rope. Aha. What are the normal uses for that kind of rope? On boats, mooring lines. Correct. Although Ray says that they're sometimes used as bell ropes in churches. Understandable why, it is a very sturdy rope. So are we looking for a a sailor or a minister? Well, in my experience, sailors seem to have the greater libido. Was Mrs. Muller criminally attacked? No external or internal traces of semen. Thanks, Mal. Anything else comes up, you let us know. So it wasn't a cram of greed, and there wasn't a sexual motive. Before leaving, we can say goodbye to Mrs. Muller. We've got to nail this guy. Okay, if you're finished jawing, we need to get moving. And then it looks like the only thing left to do is to head to the station to interview her husband, Hugo. But before we do, we can head to the nearest Gamwell to see if Cole has any messages. Phelps, badge 1247. How can I help, Detective? Are there any messages for me? He's good looking for a policeman. Yes, Detective. A green 1946 coupe registered to Mrs. Hugo Muller has been found in the parking lot adjoining the Belmont High School in Plainfields. Captain Donnelly wants you to head down there immediately to take the school janitor's statement. Thank you. So wait a minute, Mrs. Muller's car made it to the high school to pick up her daughter from the dance, but Mrs. Muller didn't? That either means she was attacked somewhere else, but then the killer climbed in her car and drove it to the school where she was supposed to be, or it means that she was attacked in the high school parking lot after getting out of the car to pick up her daughter. A bold crime to commit while a crowded high school dance is going on nearby. Not exactly the happiest of places, the coroner's office. Carruthers is a good man, professional, diligent. If you're working with a pro, it's easy to overlook the grim realities of a place like that. Funny job, that. The coroners. How so? You know, you don't want them enjoying their work too much. The wrong kind of man can get awfully lonely rattling around a joint full of corpses. Rusty, that's like something out of the pulps. You've been reading the same ones as me? I thought you were usually too drunk to get through a magazine. You know, if I close one eye and squint, you can just about make out the print. Cole and Galloway arrive at Belmont High at 5.45 p.m. The Muller car was parked near the stadium, where we find the janitor and the responding officer. This is the car? Yes, sir, detective. Have you looked it over? Superficially. I was told to wait for you guys. Thanks. We'll take it from here. What time did you see the person park the car? Late last night, after school social, maybe 1 a.m., I've been keeping a good eye out lately. We've had problems with the child molester. And this was the same man? I don't know, sir. I mean, I'd like to say yes, but truth is, it was pretty dark. All right. Tell me about this man you've been having trouble with. He hangs near the playground, tries to befriend the children. He was around here last night before the dance. Is he violent? Yes, sir. I would say so, yes. There's a son of a bitch now! Hey, you! 
go, Phelps. I'll take the car and see if I can cut him off. And conveniently, the child molester was hanging out nearby. Well, I suppose it's not surprising. Criminals do tend to return to the scene of the crime. But as soon as we spot him, he books it. Crossing the track field, we race up some stairs to find ourselves in the middle of a busy street. The child molester takes to an alleyway, and this is a straight shot. Perhaps here we can pick up some speed. But no, then he begins to jump over garden fences, which slows us down. What's your name? Who's asking? We can do this the easy way or the hard way. Name's Eli Rooney. You've been in trouble with the law before, Eli? Some. What are you doing around here? I like to keep an eye on the children. Strictly paternal, is it, Eli? Don't sass me, boy. A woman was abducted here last night, Eli, and murdered. And I would love to make you for that, you rokey motherfucker. Well, I wouldn't know nothing about that. A woman, you say? I like them a little younger than that. Turn out your pockets, Eli. Now, why would I do that? Because I'm about to break your fucking skull, Eli. Under arrest, Eli. You are in very deep trouble. A golden butterfly, just like the one Mrs. Muller was wearing. Why bother with the paperwork, Eli? I'm going to take out my gun, and I'm going to count to five. Let's see how fast you can run now. Hang on a goddamn minute. I found that thing in the parking lot. Get some backup out here, Rusty. We need to get this one downtown and into a cell. I'll tell them we got a kitty raper coming in. They can roll out the red carpet. But there's something I don't get. The janitor says that he saw the car parking at about one in the morning. So Mrs. Muller didn't make it to the high school to pick up her daughter. Whomever kidnapped her and killed her chose to drop her car off here at the Belmont High School. The very high school where her daughter was enrolled. The very high school where she was supposed to be to pick up her daughter. Is that simple coincidence? Or could somebody have known that she was coming here to pick up her daughter and chose to abandon the car here, knowing it would be found after she went missing, and hoping that finding it here at the school would remove suspicion from him? But who drove the car here? Was it her husband Hugo? Or Eli the child molester? Perhaps we can find answers by exploring the trunk. And inside, we find a familiar piece of rope. Blood and skin samples. We better get Ray Pinker out here. A triple braided rope. An exact match for the marks on her neck. And next to this are some bloodied overalls. The overalls are stenciled HM. Muller is a mechanic. I wonder what Eli does for a living. I don't know. But what are the odds that his place of business have the same initials as Hugo Muller? And finally we find a tire iron. It's from a Chrysler. Could be important. She died to strangulation, but the criminal could have incapacitated her with this tire iron first before pulling out the rope to finish murdering her. Well, gosh dang it, we just got another suspect. Things went from simple to doggone complicated pretty quickly. Sure, we found the murder weapon inside the trunk of this car, but is that enough evidence to charge Eli Rooney just because we happen to apprehend him near the car? We need to find a nearby Gamwell to set up interrogations with both of our suspects. Phelps, 1247. How could I help, Detective? I need interrogations set up at Central for both suspects being held in the Mahler homicide case. Certainly, Detective. I'll get in touch with the watch commander. Thanks for your help. When done, we can head to Central. I say we make Rooney for this. I think we should lay it on him. He was near the car, he had her jewelry, the DA will love him for it. Even if he didn't do it? Who cares whether he did it? You have kids, Phelps? He needs to be taken permanently out of harm's way. And we let Muller slide? 
for a while. He gets a free pass for now. Why would we let a man slide if he was innocent? Does Rusty think that Hugo is really guilty? But he just wants to nail Eli because Eli's a disgusting child molester. Perhaps the interrogations will reveal the truth. We arrive at Central at 7.06 p.m. You better not go soft on me in here, Phelps. We'll work the evidence, Rusty. Let him do the rest. Are they ready? Bowlers in two and the perverts in one. Get in there and get a conviction. Choices, choices. Well, we'll head to interview room two first, since it's the closest, and have a chat with Hugo Muller. I don't know who'd be worse. Here's where we stand, Hugo. Your next door neighbor heard screaming coming from your house. You were burning your blood-stained shoes. You have no one who can confirm your whereabouts last night. Your daughter says you're a violent man. We have everything we need to send you to death row. And all you have to say for yourself is, I didn't do it. I swear I didn't kill her. Give me that lie test. I can prove it. We'll start by talking about what is possibly the most incriminating evidence against Hugo, and that's the fact that we found him trying to burn his bloodied shoes. Why did you burn your shoes, Hugo? Because I knew you'd never believe me. Well, okay, well, that's a possible, if flimsy, excuse. But to see whether or not it's viable, we need to learn exactly what he claims the true story is. We'll try coaxing the story out of him by playing the good cop. Believe what? It's rabbit's blood. The guy at work brought him in and I helped him skin them. Rabbit's blood? Well, if true, this should be easy to prove simply by talking with his coworker at work. If it's a lie, it's a pretty foolish one. Though Hugo here isn't prone to making smart lies, but this satisfies our curiosity for now. Next, we can ask him about the murder weapon. Do you know anything about ropes, Hugo? As much as the next man. I I was a scout. I learned some more in the army. As did many men of that age. A very plausible story. And yet, if true, why does he look so nervous? Perhaps we can goad him into a confession by playing the bad cop. You learned to strangle with the rope in the army? With rope, with uh, my bare hands, but mainly with wire. I learned a lot of things in the army, but I, I still didn't kill my wife. For argument's sake, what type of rope would you use? If I had to, I would use a triple braid. Less flex, easier to control. <laughs> okay, well, uh, if he was a murderer, he would carry out the murder in exactly the way we found his wife murdered. Either he's stupid for admitting such a thing, or he doesn't know about the triple braid rope that we found. And he doesn't know that it was triple braid rope that was used on his wife. And if he doesn't know that, then he can't be the killer. Would a guilty man readily admit to using the exact kind of rope that was used in the murder he's being interrogated about? Or perhaps he's a gambler, and he specifically mentioned the exact type of rope that was used to kill his wife, betting that in doing so, the cops would assume that a guilty man would never admit to such a thing, therefore concluding that he's not guilty. The next puzzle we need to solve is exactly how Hugo's car found itself parked in the parking lot of Belmont High School. We found your wife's car. Someone parked it at the school late last night. Do you have anything to say about that? It wasn't me. Where do you keep your work clothes? I keep them at work in my locker. Frustratingly, the conversation moved quickly away from the car and onto his work clothes. I know we found some clothes in the car, but I wish we could talk with him more about how that car got there. Instead, we have to focus on his clothing for now. He says he keeps them in his work locker, but that's not true if the overalls we found in the trunk of his car did indeed belong to Hugo. And from everything we see here, they very well could have. Hugo again looks like a fish out of water, and so we can call him a liar. Enough lies, Hugo. Your overalls put you at the scene of the crime last night. My overalls are in the laundry of my house. Again, a claim that can be easily proven or disproved. All we have to do is drive to his house, and if we find them in the laundry, then the overalls we found in the car can't be his. But wait a minute, he mentioned just a moment ago that he kept his overalls in his work locker. They can't be both in his work locker and in the laundry at home, Unless he has more than one pair. And if he has two pairs, he could have three. Like the bloodied one we found in the trunk of the car. 
green overalls, bloodstained, with the initials HM found in the trunk of your wife's car. They can't be mine. Why, Hugo? Because if they were yours, they'd be in the incinerator too? Though Galloway does bring up a good point, we have eyewitness testimony from one of Hugo's neighbors that Hugo was seen burning something early this morning. If what he was burning was related to this crime, why would he be dumb enough to leave his overalls at the crime scene? Why would he not have taken them with him, knowing that he was going home to incinerate them? Why leave such damning evidence behind? And that raises another question, if he was already incinerating something early in the morning, why didn't he incinerate his blood-soaked shoes? Why did he wait until after the cops arrived and began interrogating him to burn the shoes? If he was burning something in the early hours of the morning to cover his crime, it seems ludicrous that he would not have burned the overalls and his shoes, which must mean that whatever he burned in the morning was unrelated to this crime. Though I am still curious to learn exactly what it was he was burning, but sadly we can't ask him about that, so instead we can ask him about the tire iron. Your wife was beaten with a tire iron, Hugo. An appropriate choice of tool for a mechanic. I know nothing about any tire iron. Now this one is perplexing because we don't get the evidence we need to say that he's lying here until after we accuse him of lying. Now we could always conclude that he is lying based on his body language here, which is as always suspicious. The proof is of course the bloody tire iron we found in the trunk, but the point of this question is not to prove that the tire iron was used to kill his wife, but to prove that he knew about the tire iron, and if he knew about it he could have used it to kill his wife. Just because a mechanic, sometimes in the course of his work, uses a tire iron, doesn't mean that finding a tire iron in the trunk is proof that Hugo Muller killed his wife. You're lying, Hugo. You're gonna have to come clean on this. You got no proof. We only learned the proof that Hugo is connected to this specific tire iron after we used the tire iron to accuse him of lying. Your wife drove a Chevrolet, Hugo. What make of car do you drive? A Chrysler Airflow. So I guess that explains why the tire iron that killed your wife came from a Chrysler. You see, we remember Cole telling us that the tire iron came from a Chrysler when we found it. But we had no idea what kind of car Hugo drove until just now. His wife's car was a Chevrolet. That's the car we found at the high school. We never found his personal car at his home. So we had no idea that he drove a Chrysler until this moment. Which means using the tire iron as evidence to accuse him is strange. At any rate, we are now left with a choice. We can choose to either charge the suspect based on everything that we've learned so far, or leave the interrogation. If we choose to charge Hugo Muller... Hugo Muller, I'm charging you with the murder of your wife. You'll be arraigned and taken before a grand jury. Book him, Rusty. With pleasure. The cops lock him away, and we close the case. However, if we choose to leave the interrogation, we can stand up, walk out of interview room two, and head over to interview room one, where we find Captain Donnelly waiting for us. Boys, you've really come through this time, haven't you? Captain, uh, we were on our way to interview Eli Rooney. Yes, Phelps, I know. This particular fiend is an old acquaintance. I have tried to reaffirm his belief in a wrathful and terrible God. Whichever way it goes, I'll be dealing personally with him. Sounds like Captain Donnelly has a vendetta against Eli Rooney. And from what we know about the man, that's understandable. You look like you've had it rough. You see me asking for your sympathy, boy? We'll start by asking him about the footprints we found at the crime scene. What size boot do you wear, Eli? Kind of like anything I get my hands on. I'm wearing 11s. <laughs> this one frustrates me. We have to go through a bit of a rigmarole to find out his shoe size. But we have him in captivity. We could simply take off his shoes. And even if he's wearing the wrong shoe size, we could measure his feet. But maybe we just don't want to sully our hands with his 
nasty shoes, and based on his body language, we can tell that he's likely lying. We don't have proof at the moment what his shoe size is, but we can wipe that smug look off his face with a little bad cop. I've done 14 years in and out of prison, son. You think you can outweigh me? You're wrong. You're maybe 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, tops. And you wear size 11s? I don't think so, Eli. That might be on the large side. Maybe 10s. Maybe 8s. Now that I come to think of it. Why punish children with your iniquity, Eli? Do you think I was never punished? You must know what you're doing is evil. Well, son, nobody's perfect. A famous excuse, Eli. I was abused, therefore I have a free pass to abuse. Thankfully, that argument doesn't play well in court. So he confesses that his shoe size is eight. Uh, so, so far, both of our subjects have exactly the same shoe size. Next, we can ask him about his work. You down on your luck, Eli? I had worse. My family ate roadkill during the Dust Bowl. But you have a job. A parolee has to have a job, correct? I had me a job down in San Pedro. I'm looking for something new. We don't know anything about Eli Rooney here, so it's hard to accuse him of lying or telling the truth. We really have to read him. And before, he was really smug. We were talking about his crimes, the crimes that he's proud of in his own twisted way. But now we're talking about his lack of work. And this inability to work causes him a bit of shame. And we can read this shame by the fact that he's now leaning back in his chair. He is crossing his arms. He is frowning, avoiding eye contact, looking around nervously. He is not comfortable with us asking about his job, either because he's ashamed of losing it or because it may in some way implicate him. But to get him to talk more, we've got to urge him by being a bad cop. This place you worked have a name? Hennessy Marine. You can't misplace big yellow letters HM out front. They give you any workwear, Eli? Sure. Green coverall. Dang thing was hot, felt like I was back in the pen wearing it. What? Both suspects have the same size foot. Both suspects have jobs where they wear green overalls. And the name of Rooney's place of employment is Hennessy Marine. HM. The same initials as Hugo Muller. You've got to be kidding me. Well, now let's see if they share a common interest in triple braided rope. After all, Rusty told us that the triple braided rope used to kill Deirdre was often used as mooring lines. And we just learned that Eli here works with ships. You ever tie up any of your victims, Eli? It's not a nice thing to go calling them. What would you call them? I can't say. I learned a long time ago not to go talk about the things I like. Talking about it just seems to get people's dander up. Answer the goddamn question, Rooney, before I brain you. See what I mean? Short answer is yes. You have any preference regarding rope, Eli? I know a good rope from a bad rope, if that's what you mean. That's not what you mean, is it? Any old rope will do me fine. So we learn that this monster ties up children in order to abuse them. But do we think that this man would be particular about the kind of rope he chooses to use to abuse them? Well, I don't know. Hugo, a former military man and a scout, knows the differences between rope and was so educated on the topic that he could give us an exact reason why using a triple braid would be better for strangling someone. This guy probably doesn't know a triple braid from a shoestring. He strikes me as the kind of guy that would use whatever's at his disposal to satisfy his dark desires. And based on his body language, sitting up straight, meeting eyes with Cole, I think we can believe he's telling us the truth when he says that the type of rope doesn't matter. Farm boy like you, Eli, must prefer McGay for roping, am I right? I prefer braid, tie hitching braid, it stays tied. Well, never mind. Looks like he does have experience with rope. And he prefers, you guessed it, a braided rope. Now, he didn't mention triple braid specifically, but now we've got two suspects who admit to preferring braided rope. What are the odds? All right, so we've got means and opportunity for both of our suspects. Both suspects have access to and are familiar with the exact type of rope that murdered Mrs. Muller. 
and both suspects are unaccounted for without an alibi during the time that Mrs. Muller went missing and was presumably murdered. But what we don't have is motive. We're supposed to believe that Hugo Muller's motive for murdering his wife is that she spends too much money? That is, after all, what they had argued about that day. She liked to buy dresses and dress herself up. But is that motive for murder? I suppose any old thing could be a motive for murder, depending on how small-minded the murderer is. It just seems to me that murder's an extreme response to a wife who spends too much money. But that's the motive we have for him. But what motive do we have for Eli here? The money? Well, maybe he did, after all, have her brooch. But where's the watch? And where's the wedding ring? And why did he leave the bills in the purse? If we're to believe that he murdered her, stripped her naked, ripped off her watch, and cut off her wedding ring, where did he hide them? If he had a place to hide those precious objects, why didn't he put the brooch in the same place? Why would he carry it on his person, where it can be discovered and hence he becomes implicated in her death, when he could just put it in the safe place where he put the watch and the ring? A much more likely explanation is the one that he provided, which is that he found it in the parking lot, right next to the car where we found the murder weapon. But perhaps Eli here can elaborate more on his motive. You killed Mrs. Muller and stole her jewelry. That ain't so. Ain't done nothing like that. But he still denies it. Well, maybe we can rile him up a bit, paint a scary picture about a jury who doesn't believe him, and coerce a confession out of him by playing the bad cop. You have no job and nowhere to live by the smell of things, and you need money. You've been in trouble before, Eli. Who do you think a jury will believe? I've been in trouble for other things, but I ain't never killed no one. I saw that car coming to the parking lot late last night. Man got changed there and put his coveralls in the trunk. I saw him drop the butterfly in the lamplight, and he strolled out, cool as you like. And I went over and I picked it up. Now we have to decide whether or not the evidence we have is enough to charge Eli. Now it's clear that Galloway and the captain want to charge this guy. He's a disgusting predator. They'd love to pin the crime on him, and the streets of L.A. would be safer with him behind bars. But is there enough evidence to show that he killed Deirdre? There's the big problem with the jewelry, as we discussed, and also he doesn't admit to the crime. It seems strange to me that he would be so forthcoming about admitting to his proclivities, which give the police enough reason to want to see him hang, and yet so adamant that he didn't commit the murder. You'd think that if he did commit the murder, he'd at least be smug about his denial, just like he was smug when talking about his past child molestation crimes. But no, when he denies being a murderer, he does so earnestly. If we choose to charge Eli... Eli Rooney, I'm charging you with the first-degree murder of Deirdre Muller. You want to put me back in the stir that badly, boy? You go ahead and try. I'll beat that rap. I ain't a killer. And we get a good ending. Ah, Phelps, Galloway, congratulations are at hand. Drink, boys? I think you'll receive a commendation for this one, gentlemen. In the meantime, I'll speak to the DA about expediting the passage of the case. We need swift and merciless justice for poor Deirdre. However, it is possible to fail both interrogations. If we got too few questions correct during either interrogation, we can walk away from both of them without the option to charge either Eli or Hugo. If that's the case, when we finish interrogating Eli, Coles says, I don't like you, Eli. I think you're an evil man. I think you try to pass off your pain to other people. I can't make you for this case. But my consolation is that I don't think you will be out of prison for very long. You can count on it, shitbird. By the way, Eli, the captain and the hat squad would like to talk to you next. Any idea what they might want to talk about? 
That's the guy. Detective, that's him. That's the guy who parked the car. I'm sure of it. Hey, he's getting away. That's not true. I can't. I can't go to jail. Hugo Muller flees the scene and takes us on a car chase through the streets of L.A. You gotta get me closer. Hit him, Cole. Spin him out. Keep it steady and I'll try to bust his tires. Hit him. Clean this asshole off the road. Keep it on the road, goddammit! It ends here, Hugo. Once we get the janitor's statement, you'll be staring down a murder charge. Put your hands in the air! We then see them put Hugo in prison just like last time, but this time... I have to say I'm disappointed. I stood in front of a troop of reporters and made promises. Promises of swift and fearful retribution, and you bring me an armful of vagary and happenstance. You made the department look bad, lad. Do it again and your career as a policeman will come to an abrupt and ignominious end. You two are back on the streets. Find street criminals, rouse them, beat them, and restore some fervor to your police work. Your next case will come when you've revived my faith in your abilities. Now get out of here! So which outcome is the accurate one? Well, we never really get a payoff here. Though the janitor's witness testimony, which we only get if we fail both interrogations, puts Hugo Muller in the possession of the murder weapon at one o'clock in the morning. But the janitor could be wrong. He even said so himself when we first interviewed him in the parking lot, that it was so dark that night, he really couldn't say who dropped off the car. If so, how could he be so sure of Hugo's guilt? The truth is that no matter how this case ends, it leaves us with an uneasy feeling and unanswered questions, much like the last case. Remember in the red lipstick murder, we were only able to charge our suspect after finding a box filled with the murder weapon and some bloody rags in the suspect's house, but conveniently placed beneath an open window. And here we find a similar scene. The murder weapon and more bloody clothing conveniently placed alongside clothing that can incriminate both of our suspects. Who murders a person wearing an outfit embroidered with your own initials or with the name of the company where you work where you can easily be tracked down and then leaves it alongside the murder weapon in the trunk of a car they know the police are gonna find? No one. Part of me thinks it doesn't really matter if we charge Hugo or Eli, because either way, we haven't caught the killer. But sadly, we'll only know for sure if we find another poor woman stripped down and murdered in a similar fashion. We can only hope that it doesn't come to that. But what are your thoughts on the Golden Butterfly? How did you choose to resolve this case during your gameplay? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. We're well on our way through our series on L.A. Noir, but we still have so many more cases to get through. It'll take me a while, but don't worry, we'll get through it all. If you want to make sure you don't miss the next case, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. They also come in a whole bunch of other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. 
If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with a brand new video.